The wayfinding landscape is changing. So welcome to Endpoint's Wayfinding Exchange podcast. We want to connect with leading experts, tech innovators, and key contributors to exchange knowledge and innovation in physical and digital wayfinding. We want to shape the future of wayfinding through discussion, collaboration, and shared expertise. And this is why we have created this podcast series. Enjoy the episode. back to our latest episode today we've got with us Ricardo Di Franceschi uh, Ricardo's creative director at Dalton Mag for those that don't know uh, which is probably unlikely Dalton Mag is an international and independent type design studio they have over 50 type designers and font developers creative directors software engineers spanning 25 nationalities and speaking some 14 languages They've worked for everybody from the big tech companies like Google and Amazon to place branding initiatives for Rio 2016, Vienna City, and they work with clients large and small, local and global, on a range of type-related services, including logo refinements, font modifications, as well as small, medium and large bespoke custom fonts. So it's great to see you again, Ricardo. Thanks for your time on this. Typography is pretty much at the, the heart of everything we do in terms of communication for the built environment. Um, so it's always, it's always interesting to hear your thoughts and you know, discuss what's happening in the world of typography. So just to kick off, tell us about Dalton Mag. Um, explain some of the projects you're working on, if you can, or have worked on that might be relevant to, to our space. Mm-hmm. Hello, hello, Gideon. It's, it's great to be to be here, and uh, thank you for for having me, and thank you for for having us. Yes, so uh, Dalton Mag is a type design studio. So what we do, as you mentioned already, is uh, designing new typefaces and implementing them into fonts. Uh, so we don't do graphics for uh, web print, animation, we just focus on, uh, uh, you know, the world of typefaces, the wonderful world of typefaces. Um, so I think one thing that I'd like to stress, as you did already, is the fact that we have so many different uh, nationalities in our team. I think it's a great uh, asset to us to have so many cultures represented in our team. And also, it's very useful when it comes to working with uh, with different brands from different places as well. Myself, as you mentioned, I'm a creative director. I am originally from Italy, Milan, hence my strange uh, accent. And I think when it comes to what we are involved with at the moment, I would probably start from our uh, library, our catalog of retail typefaces, which is always an interesting uh, place to start from because it's a bit of a, can be a bit of a playground where we play with different things that are getting us excited to do, for instance, with technology, font technology. And perhaps we haven't had a chance to work with commercially yet. So we set our own brief and use our library to explore that theme. One thing I'd mention in that sense is a project called Shader Color, which is a typeface that we developed recently. And it's uh, a type that uh, takes advantage of a recent innovation in font technology to do with uh, color fonts being much more powerful they've, than they've ever been before in terms of enabling things like different shades, uh, transparency, as well as different palettes that a user can select from. So shader color is basically an exploration of the aesthetics of gaming and just pushes a little bit the envelope in terms of what can be achieved through fonts, actual text, live text, utilizing color. Other than that, we are involved with the usual uh, sort of uh, custom fonts that you mentioned. We have quite a few uh, running at all times. Because of NDAs, I won't be able to, to talk about them in detail, but yeah, we try and sort of uh, keep ourselves busy with, with those as well. And uh, yeah, I think that's it in a, in a nutshell, really. One thing we, we do uh, a lot is different writing systems. So there's always different languages and scripts being developed. Yeah, cool. So, I mean, just going back to your shader color font, was it? So, I mean, I guess through the history of Dalton Mag, you, you know, it's, you've seen typography go from, I guess, purely print to very much in the digital world. So it was interesting you mentioned gaming. Is that is that a market for you guys? Are, are big games coming to you guys for you know, bespoke typography? 
Yes, uh, but it's also something that we would like to measure ourselves more um, with going forwards. And um, it's definitely an exciting field in that it sort of touches upon the theme also of um, augmented reality and virtual reality, which it's a very popular area. And going forward, I think we'll see more and more stuff happening there. So, um, yeah, definitely it's a field we'd like to do more work in going forward. Yeah, yeah, I, I bet as the as the metaverse continues to grow, I'm sure there'll be a, a need for typography and branding. I mean, what are some of those challenges for translating a typeface you know, into our world, the built environment, where I guess scale is is normally an element? You know, how is that different to developing typefaces for for digital purposes? I mean, now for us, navigation appears on signs, it appears on maps, it appears on apps. You know, what are the challenges creating a consistent typographic approach for all those different mediums? Um, where I would start from is saying that uh, um, in the built environment, as we intended traditionally, we have uh, a physical component, which I think it's a very exciting aspect. And humankind has always used the depth and light to project shadows in order to create exciting uh, lettering, pieces of lettering in, in signage and in, if you think of inscriptions or applied letters. And that's something that uh, wasn't quite possible in digital, I would say. But now with virtual reality, that conversation, I think, can start and we can start looking at how to perhaps reproducing some of those experiences in, in a virtual digital environment as well. When it comes to wayfinding, uh, particularly, I think one important aspect that defines lettering wayfinding traditionally in the built environment is uh, the fact that they are permanent. So uh, they come with the cost of implementation as you go and produce uh, signs, uh, and they are meant to be looked at uh, from a distance as well, which comes with certain accessibility, legibility requirements. So I think historically that has determined a little bit the kind of letter styles that you would have uh, on signage. And I'm thinking of fairly compact letter form with very large X height, meaning the height of your lowercase X, so that the letters are really as legible as possible while keeping uh, or while occupying as little space as possible and containing the, the, the cost of production that way. Now, when we go into the digital environment and the the, the UI and UX environment particularly, uh, you have different challenges such as uh, working with text that needs to be read at smaller sizes on your screen, you know, handheld device, and uh, perhaps used to set also sentences or short passages of text, which really requires for letters to be wider and have more generous proportions that allow them to breathe uh, better. In our experience, we have a case which is very interesting in this sense. is a typeface called Stroudly, which we developed for signage, uh, and therefore it has fairly compact uh, proportions. But then a couple of years ago, we derived from it a typeface optimized for UI and UX called Dark Mode, uh, that again, among other adjustments, have uh, more generous and sort of wider and more comfortable proportions. Uh, I think that this is the kind of uh, question that we are facing now, how to um, integrate the uh, sort of uh, uh, physical um, built environment experience with the digital aspect of, of navigation. And that's something that clients have been asking more and more uh, for in the recent uh, years. And um, I think it kind of leads us nicely to the conclusion that, as it was said before in this post podcast series of, of yours, uh, at the end of the day, what we are after is a way of enabling a navigation experience which integrates the physical and the digital experience in one well thought through system uh, and therefore is more of a collaboration between these two aspects rather than a clear division between the two yeah i think that's always that's always our challenge is often on the client side these things are dealt with by different teams and trying to get everybody uh, you know a digital team that's doing some big background project with the front of house team that are doing a, a customer experience project with the with the branding team that you know looking at things from an overall perspective it's it, it is of a, quite a challenge getting everybody together and, and and thinking collaboratively and thinking about an experience like you say from as a seamless experience from the user's perspective mm -hmm. 
I think, Gideon, in that sense, the I think typography can really be sort of a an element that brings different departments together as well, you know, because uh, it can run through as a theme and really unify the experience, I believe. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, just going back to some of those legibility and readability components, just for our general audience, for signage, for instance, for built environment, you mentioned the X height. Are there are there other characteristics of, of a typical typeface that lend themselves to being more legible than others? Um, one thing I'd say straight away is that this is as much about the typeface you choose as it is uh, about how you use it as well, and you can kind of easily uh, ruin or butcher, you know, the, the the performance of a of a good typeface by setting it poorly. Um, now, when it comes to the anatomy of of the typeface and uh, what makes it uh, uh, legible, readable, and and accessible, again, we mentioned the the excite as you just uh, touched on. I think the excite really has to do with the breathing space that your alphabet has in order to achieve clarity and a crisp uh, appearance on the page, whether printed or, or digital. Other features that help a lot in that sense are uh, open counters. If you think of your lowercase a or e, an open aperture that breathes also at smaller sizes, generous letter spacing. We know from uh, research that that is uh, one of the most important uh, aspects. I think also of weight as a very important uh, element, meaning you want to have a system that allows you for enough distinction between your bold weight in order to create emphasis against your regular, you know, core weight in your system. You can think of it as you do with uh, perhaps color in uh, accessibility when you set your uh, text in black on a, on a yellow background or vice versa, right? Think of an airport and you want to create that kind of distinction. So uh, bold needs to stand out compared to, to the regular. And another important aspect to do with weight is that uh, you want to understand what's the minimum size that you can afford using your lighter weights such as hairline or thin uh, or your darker weights such as extra bold and heavy so that the former don't become uh, too feeble to work and the latter don't become too crowded to work. Size is a very important aspect, especially in relation with, with weight. And finally, I would mention uh, um, variation. So the fact that you want to have uh, disambiguation between letters that may be confused think of uppercase i and lowercase l which we often recommend having a little hook at the bottom uh, but also variation of proportions where the width of your letters is organically varying across different characters rather than being modularly standardized and you know there's a place for that as well perhaps in a headline font uh, but when it comes to again enhancing the reading experience we want to see some variation in, in those proportions to create a bit of a human friendly <laughs> reading experience with an organic uh, rhythm we often have well often we, we've come across situations in the past where we uh, maybe the, the brand has a, a typeface that they want us to use for wayfinding and navigation and um, you start looking at the numerals for instance and the, and the numeral one is just a stick you know there's no character to it at all and it, it could easily be confused with a with an l or an i so we, we it's one of those times when we often have to ask for the the um the typeface to be modified going back to the that that idea of legibility like you say the bowls the excites which is all very well for western typefaces i, I think one of the challenges we're, we're having now is obviously we work across multiple geographies and many clients now are, are asking for you know dual language and even tri language solutions for for signage and, and and other communications i guess this is where your international team come in how do you how do you get over the, the challenges of legibility in languages with different characters abroad um well, this is a super fascinating subject and, and a very, very big one. And uh, I think that uh, one, one important distinction to make perhaps straight away is that between languages and, and writing systems, so, you know, English and Spanish being two languages that use predominantly the same writing system, Latin, whereas, for instance, uh, uh, Devanagari and Latin being two different writing systems used, for instance, to write uh, Hindi and, and English. And I think when we think of dual uh, language and, and multi-language experiences, 
we should be also thinking of uh, dual and multi script or writing system uh, experiences. What uh, I would say is that one of the biggest challenges is that of sort of uh, uh, making sure that uh, when matching different uh, languages and writing systems, the size, the, the visual size of the letters, uh, as well as the color, the typographic color is compatible so that you can uh, create a similar structure in your documents, in your contents, and a similar hierarchy as well between different elements within that system of contents that you that you have. Uh, and the other big area is the expression. So you want to make sure that your type speaks to the gut of the reader in a similar way, whether he or she is reading in uh, Arabic or Hebrew or, or, or English. So you, if you want a sense of heritage to come through, uh, or if you want a sense of modernity and progressive to come through, you're able to capture those nuances and translating them across different uh, locales, let's say. And uh, a key to that is the understanding of the um, sort of uh, visual grammar of a certain writing system and its tradition. Uh, and often it's very useful to go back to the inspiring tool that is behind uh, the letter forms for that specific uh, writing system. And by that, I mean the pen, really. Uh, for instance, behind the Latin writing system and behind the Arabic writing system, we have the same tool, which is the Brodney pen but depending on the angle at which it was traditionally held uh, we had the result that the latin writing system developed with emphasis and and, and uh, uh, weight on the vertical strokes think of your uppercase h you know thick vertical strokes and thin horizontal strokes uh, whereas in arabic you have emphasis on the horizontal strokes hence that kind of strong baseline and, and thinner vertical strokes when it comes to sort of uh, the different options that that one has i would say that uh, a good option could be that of a custom typeface i think is a great uh, um, opportunity to develop a custom typeface when you want to make sure that you cover different writing systems and languages in, a, in an effective way. It could allow you perhaps to also make a connection with the sense of place that may come uh, with a certain sort of uh, uh, um, use of your typeface. Uh, imagine that your typeface needs to be used in a certain uh, city or neighborhood. You want to maybe uh, use that to your advantage and create a specific special flavor that represents the idea identity of that of that neighborhood or uh, or city uh, or there are great options off the shelf as well which may meet your needs we recently actually just two weeks ago released a big update to our typeface active grotesque that includes now uh, more writing systems that, than ever before, including uh, Armenian and, and Thai. Um, and my, my final advice would be that of considering all the languages and the writing systems from the first place, like from the beginning, rather than finding yourself perhaps designing your system in Latin, you know, English first, and then having to sort of uh, run after the other languages and, and find solutions that, or, or fit them into the system that you set up already. So the best result is given by a system that grows organically considering all the different uh, languages that you need. So it's, yeah, choosing typefaces for different writing to, it's not as easy as just matching stroke widths and looking for similar curvatures. I guess what you're saying is that they could be interpreted locally, you know, differently to how Europeans interpret the typeface that we're trying to match to. It's a cultural thing. And I, I you know, I guess people can go to you for that sort of advice and that sort of knowledge because it's very easy for us as uh, western designers to like you say choose a typeface we're familiar with and then just try and match typefaces to that so they look sort of similar and proportional but actually culturally they might be saying something completely different absolutely yes and uh, um, i think as a as a brand or as as, as an institution is you know it's more and more important that you show the sensitivity that is behind kind of uh, uh, making sure that your visual system works across different cultures and uh, we help a lot of brands we've done this with uh, uh, with airbnb or facebook for instance in the last few years again achieving a, a look and feel 
that looks consistent across the different countries. It's also a case of kind of uh, empowering users from different places to have the same sort of visual expression of their contents. You know, type is about written communication. That That's what it is about. And uh, the, the example of our work with Facebook comes to mind where we designed a typeface for their camera app which is what you use when you when you type your stories in, in Facebook and you want to write a bit of text underneath your picture or something like that or superimpose onto your picture. And there uh, uh, we designed a few different styles, a brush script, a modular constructed compact uh, style and so on. And we wanted for these styles to be available, each of them across the different languages, you know, Chinese, Arabic, uh, English, and so on, uh, so that a user would be able to express their message as they were communicating their story uh, with the same freedom of choosing between different uh, Mm -hmm. moods, really. Uh, it's just fascinating. I mean, j- j- just briefly going back to that, you mentioned the original tool. So you said for Europeans, it's the, the thick nib. We've just opened a studio in Singapore. And obviously, now we're, we're dealing with you know different languages, different writing systems around there. Is it? Is it, what's the origins there? Is that more? Is that more to do with the brush rather than the the nib? Yes, there would be more of a brush derived uh, kind of a, a contrast or, or, or color when it comes to the stroke. Uh, and uh, yeah, that sort of uh, can be used to understand also how the shapes, you know, and the, and the characters are, are, are shaped. Um, I think the one of the biggest challenges when it comes to Chinese particularly is that of sort of uh, designing type and sort of choosing type uh, in such a way that the typographic color is compatible with other writing systems is in that Chinese can become quite dense on the page, you know, compared, for instance, with the Latin writing system where the the, the letter forms are incredibly uh, simple comparatively. So, you know, you may want to have a a monolinear typeface with low contrast, imagine something similar to Futura, like a modern low contrast sans serif typeface. When you go into Chinese, you have to actually reduce the weight of your strokes, maintaining them monolinear, but reducing massively the weight so that things look visually comparable, especially at smaller sizes on on the page. So uh, just to go back to your question of whether this is trivial, I would say it's not trivial. (laughs) There is a lot of kind of a a lot of uh, experience and knowledge that needs to go into this, uh, into this, which at the end of the day is, you know, typographic uh, matchmaking, typographic matching across different writing systems, again, in order to make sure that the communication in different languages happens uh, with the same power and the same uh, effect across different places and, and languages and cultures. I mean, we, one of the challenges we find when discussing or suggesting fonts type to, to our clients and, and actually trying to push for something that's quite bespoke and, and, and you know, captures the spirit of whatever the project is, the architecture, the, the town, the city, it's often seen as, as you know, it's quite an expensive uh, thing to do. Obviously, not everybody's got the money of Google and Facebook and the, the big tech brands. But is there are there ways? I mean, you modify type as well as creating bespoke, brand new typefaces. And is most of your work modification um, rather than you know, new? And and are there approaches you can take to you know create a, a small family that's right for a fairly modest architectural project rather than a you know a full suite of, of all the different weights etc cetera, etc cetera? explain to us maybe and, and and hopefully some of the people listen to this that actually it's not as scary as, or as expensive as people think to have something that is um, fits for them uh, without going down the whole route of a, of a brand new typeface. Well, I would say that uh, the custom route remains the most powerful because you're basically crafting something from scratch and you are in complete control of all the aspects and requirements from a technical as well as an aesthetic point of view. There are ways, though, to keep the price of a custom typeface down, such as uh, uh, working on what the two main variables are, the size of your uh, character set, meaning how many languages are being talked by your type. Uh, So we do offer, for instance, something called English-only campaign character set, uh, 
which is a very agile character set that is uh, tailored upon the requirements of the English uh, language and uh, uh, it doesn't include too many punctuation marks, for instance, that you may not need for your standard daily use. Similarly, you mentioned weights. Uh, there are ways of, of course, containing your weight system and your, your, your style system so that you just focus on whatever the weights uh, uh, that you need are. Uh, if it's a typeface for an architectural project or the sort of uh, brand of a, of a neighborhood, you may want to just focus on a display alphabet, single weight for your, uh, you know, uh, impactful uh, text where you want readers to or passerbys to look at it uh, on top of reading what's, what's written. Uh, and perhaps with the more uh, sort of reading intensive um, contents, you may license something off the shelf. So it could be a bit of a uh, mixed approach. Now, modification is also something that we do uh, a lot, as you mentioned, and uh, uh, it could be more affordable. Yes, it could, it's, it's, it's usually um, faster, of course, because you work starting from an existing starting point and uh, you go and make tweaks or change more or less depending on how much of an involved change you desire. Uh, and uh, it can get you to a, to a specific uh, place. Certainly, it's quite, a, it's quite a powerful result that as well. One thing to mention, is that uh, a modification doesn't quite involve a transfer of IP uh, to the end client. It involves exclusive use of that version of the typeface by the client, but the IP, the intellectual property, doesn't get transferred. Whereas with custom, the way at least we intend it at, at Daltomag, we transfer completely the intellectual property property to the client so that their typeface that typeface becomes theirs forever to do whatever they want with it in the future as well. So there are definitely a number of different approaches and what we do and what I do as well alongside my colleagues uh, as a creative director is that of uh, helping navigate these different options. So starting a conversation and sort of, uh, uh, you know, answering the, 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 the questions that a client may have and help them find the best solution for them. And, you know, it may be a mix of different approaches or, uh, or a specific tailor-made approach just for them. I think that's really useful to let people know as well, because <clears throat> I think there's nothing quite like having your own custom typeface to set you apart from be it your competition or, or other conflicting information that might not might be nearby. I think especially when it comes to the sense of place, identity, I believe that there is a huge potential there. And uh, we've started seeing uh, as type has become perhaps a little bit more popular as a topic in the conversations within the design uh, scene. You know, I studied uh, uh, when the Vignelli theory was still dominant of, you know, you need just uh, five or six typefaces and that's it. I think in the last years, there is much more attention around diversity in type and, and, and bespoke uh, solutions as well. But I feel that in the area of place branding, particularly, whether you're thinking of uh, the brand for a nation or down to... Uh, you know, a set of buildings, I think that there is a huge uh, potential for institutions to do more and sort of uh, capitalize on what the special flavor of their place is and building on the heritage that that place has or thinking also of uh, different forms of designing such as co-design, which is very popular uh, in, the last, in the last few years. I think something, an approach of that kind could really help shaping a typeface that feels and looks like a certain community. I just like to sort of stress that there is a lot to be explored there. And, and you know, I hope that uh, that myself and us will be uh, part of more and more conversations around that specific area in the in the future. Definitely. I mean, it's, um, I, I know, it's, it, you know, this subject is very close to all of our design team's hearts. Uh, they're all typographic um well, probably not nerds, but you know, they, it's it's very it's very dear to their hearts, and um, I think this is partly why we like this format because hopefully, you know, potentially clients who may be not as versed in you know typography, the power of typography, you know, they, they've not had they've not gone through that process of thinking why things feel different. You know, it's just a list you choose on the computer, um, but actually, it's had such a profound effect on on how people feel about place how they interact with a, a brand how they feel about a brand so it's it's i think one of those often overlooked things by uh, clients and it's it's often it is the design teams who are really trying to push and and almost educate so hopefully 
Uh, hopefully some clients will listen to this and, and not be quite as um, scared or ill-informed about commissioning something that's you know special and, and for them. So, yeah, hope, fingers crossed. Um, we always ask about um, technology, the future. I mean, where do you see... You know, what, what are the trends, what's happening in the, in, in, in the world of typography? I, I know you touched on AI and metaverse earlier. I mean, are you, what, what are you seeing? What's keeping you awake at night with excitement or dread? <laughs> well, I mean, technology has always been uh, fundamental in, in typography since day one, since typography was, was invented uh, as a means of reproducing or producing books faster and sort of cheaper. And uh, we live within the digital era of, of type. So fonts are uh, uh, pieces of uh, software. You know, and as such, they have uh, version numbers and bugs. We try not to have bugs, but they do happen sometimes. And uh, an understanding of technology is fundamental to uh, fonts nowadays. And I think this goes beyond, it, it can be sort of looked at on three different levels, meaning the actual font making, making of fonts, uh, but also typesetting, you know, and the technology behind uh, setting your, your text, uh, as well as rendering technology. So how your type shapes up on screen and how uh, your, your text gets rasterized into, into pixels. Now, when it comes to the present and the future and what keeps us up at night, as you put it, I think one uh, very fascinating aspect is variable fonts, uh, which is the technology that basically allows you to produce, ship, distribute, and access different weights in your type system through one single font file. And that makes the file size smaller and makes the implementation logistically easier. That works particularly well or can work particularly well as the uh, technology becomes more and more spread in the design community in order to uh, sort of enable responsive design. Think, for instance, of uh, optical sizes and the fact that we know that type in order to perform best when set large needs to be adjusted in a different way than uh, it does in order to perform best when set small, at small sizes. Uh, with variable fonts, you can actually have different optical sizes uh, accessible through one single font file. And there are also recent developments where the software will pick up automatically the best possible version of that typeface uh, optically, you know, uh, based on the uh, point size or pixel size that you specify in your in your document. So I think this is going to be very exciting in the in the future. Responsiveness, I think it's a, it's a big word that that has made it into type thanks to variable fonts. Another aspect is AR, MR, VR, all the Rs that you can think of, uh, especially augmented reality, you know, for, for us, our world, that of uh, sort of, uh, or, or your world, I should say, that of uh, uh, wayfinding and navigation, I think it becomes more and more important to think of how your text shapes at the intersection of that digital and that physical experience we were talking about before uh, through a handheld device, you know, on your screen or through goggles as well going forwards, how text uh, is used on your uh, screen in order to sort of uh, uh, enhance your navigation experience interacting with the physical elements that are there to be used as well as uh, uh, as navigation elements and finally i would mention the big topic of um, artificial intelligence which has been sort of the hot topic in the design and beyond design conversations for the for the last uh, few months and weeks and i think there the most interesting aspect from a type point of view is how that will impact font making and the way we create uh, new fonts uh, because it opens up all kind of questions on how to make the process faster and better and how the logistics will work uh, but also like in all other areas of human creativity the ethical side of it you know and how we create new stuff that feels original uh, is thought through uh, and uh, work as well as or better than if we crafted it manually uh, ourselves so it's it's a big to topic and you know maybe 
maybe we can meet again in a few years and look back at this, uh, at how we were looking at it in 2023 and sort of uh, have a laugh together or, or sort of see how things really went. Mm. I mean, you, you're absolutely right. It feels like a bit of a, you know, one of those moments in history that may take a while to percolate and permeate, but I can't help but sense there's massive changes on the way for, for our industry, um, like you said, in the way that things are made crafted, created, distributed. It could be quite profound. Who, who knows? Look, that's been, it's been fantastic as ever to speak to you, Ricardo. Thanks very much for your time. I just had one last question, just very briefly again. Was your, um, you mentioned your, the, the Dalton Marg uh, library. How, many, how, how large is the, the library at the moment? Uh, oh. <laughs> I, I don't know that figure off the top of my head, to be honest. I, uh, it's a few dozen typefaces. Uh, it's difficult also to answer in that you have different uh, size of families. For instance, I mentioned before the typeface dark mode. There is dark mode and there is dark mode mono, which is monospaced. Each of them comes in different weights and styles. Uh, but all I can say is that that is ever growing and uh, we try and go and cover different uh, uh, areas and different sort of uh, visual fields that we haven't touched yet. And so it's a constant evolution and we we try and include new writing systems all the time. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those aspects where perhaps the whole pandemic uh, phase somehow had some beneficial effects in that we were able to focus more on the library, on our own catalog, whereas before we were uh, invariably busy with customers work. So I have to say that in the last, let's say, three, four years, we really kind of stepped up our game when it comes to the library and we were able to add quite a, a few new exciting designs. And at this moment in time and uh, for the future as well, uh, what we do and what we want to keep doing is devoting a certain percentage of our studio time to library work, no matter how much custom work sort of we have, because we find that's a very healthy practice, again, in order to go and experiment with, with different things and you know push a bit the, the the creative envelope as well so yeah i would say stay tuned because there is definitely more to happen there in in the library brilliant well look if someone wants to um get hold of your library or or have a conversation with you about something more bespoke what's the best way to get in touch with you uh, so that would be www.daltomag.com uh, and uh, um, the email address would be info at daltomag.com and uh, of course we also you know reachable and available through the social media you know linkedin and instagram and twitter so definitely i, I would just encourage everybody to get in touch and send us a line anything to do with type and fonts because uh, we're very passionate about this and i think it's it's good to start a conversation then you don't know where it will lead you but you know i think it's always good to uh, to chat things through and uh, and leave no stones unturned when it comes to embarking on you know a journey to do with the type system in the typography of your of your brand or or institution so do get in touch absolutely get in touch with these guys i mean i think you you know your reputation and i'd imagine most people in with anything to do with graphic design or, or even branding has come across the name you know it stands for craft attention to detail so reach out to ricardo and dalton marg for all your typographic requirements listening to our latest wayfinding exchange podcast stay tuned for further episodes and feel free to contact us with any questions and suggestions for future episodes